And so this hour, in the last of these three interactive sessions in which Kevin Harrington will be discussing overcoming my doubts, uh, we're fortunate to have him with us. And Kevin has uh, written a very popular book that we publish here at Truth Publications, Finding My Faith. It meets a need that I think is real, where it, it honestly addresses that struggle, those questions that people can arise, young people, but not merely young. All of us can struggle with doubt, even as was pointed out uh, by the apostles just before Jesus returned to heaven. Uh, so, Brother Harrington graduated from FC in 2010, has since then preached in Indiana, Nevada, Georgia, and is currently uh, in the Athens area, laboring with the Marion Street Congregation. They're in the midst of a gospel meeting this week, and so he's taking time off from those activities to be with us this morning, and was here yesterday to participate in the open forum in the afternoon. Uh, but he and his wife, Brooke, they have four children, Landon, Eli, Wilson, and Hadley. And so we're glad to have him with us, and we appreciate the relationship that we have with him uh, in, in this organization, and now look forward to hearing him both lecture and then field questions as we interact after he is finished. Kevin. Well, good afternoon. He said that I was taking a break from the gospel meeting duties. I'm really taking a break from those four children who are at home. So uh, getting to speak to adults uh, is, is a nice change. Uh, but no, I'm blessed to be here. I'm, I'm excited. I, grew up reading several of your books and, uh, and, and feel like learning from, from many of you who have been here for, for many years and now they've asked me to speak and in some ways I feel inadequate to, to speak to a, a room like this where um, there are men who uh, have demonstrated their faith far longer than I have and um, that I've learned from but I'm just I'm thankful for the opportunity. I worked with Marty Pickup for a year while in college, and he taught me one very valuable lesson. He said, Kevin, there's a lot of good things you can say. He said, but when you speak, you speak to the seven-year-old, and maybe the 70-year-old will understand too. And when I thought about what this hour meant for really the entire week, but uh, especially what the topic that I was given, overcoming my doubts, it's titled Practical Apologetics. Uh, what can I use in my life and what can I take out of this room to use daily? And then I got to thinking more about the topic given, overcoming my doubts. It's very personal to me. And I'll share with you some of the things that I went through as a young Christian and, and maybe some of you are, are dealing with and, and I'm still dealing with to a certain extent on how we can overcome some of these things. But first I want to draw your attention to a, a gentleman who sat in his cold, dark prison cell, and he began contemplating all the, the choices that he had made that had led him to his current surroundings. He started asking questions like, had he associated himself with the wrong kinds of people, and had he taken his convictions too far? He had devoted his entire adult life, at least, to, to a certain cause that had led him to sitting in prison, and eventually his death. He was beginning to doubt what he believed in, and, and more importantly, who he believed in. Was Jesus really the Son of God? Was he really the Messiah that had been waited on for generations? Or was all this just a, a scam? False claims by a man claiming to be somebody greater than who he really was. You would probably be shocked to find out that that man who I'm talking about is none other than the cousin of our Savior, John the Baptist. In Matthew chapter 11 and in verse 3, really in verse 2, it says, When John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? That question was always interesting to me. Because here's John the Baptist, the, the same John whose birth was announced by angels and spent his life teaching about the coming Messiah, the same John who baptized Jesus and saw the, the, the Spirit descend upon heaven and hearing the God say, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, that same John had to send disciples to, to Jesus saying, are you the chosen one? 
Are you the one we're waiting for? Or are we looking for somebody else? And I always found that question to be interesting because they weren't looking for Jesus. Now, this is, remember, before Facebook and social media. I understand they didn't have a picture of Jesus. And they weren't saying, are you Jesus? We're looking for Jesus. Are you him? No, they're saying, are you the chosen one? There's a lot of claims about who you are, Jesus. Are you him? Are you this Messiah? Are you the one we're waiting for? Doubt had set in. When you look at the idea of, of what doubt is, we talked a lot about this yesterday in that open forum. Uh, and so those of you who were there, you probably have permission to stand up now and leave. You've heard some of these things already. But uh, the idea of doubt is defined as to be uncertain about something or to believe that something may not be true or unlikely. That's kind of the common definition to, to doubt that, that we give. I, I doubt that Bigfoot is real. It's uncertain. There are photographs, right? But I, I still doubt it. People are trying to find evidence, but yet he's elusive. I, it's, it seems unlikely. There's video evidence of UFOs, and people say that they've seen them and been inducted, but it's, to me it's unlikely. I doubt it. And I'm sure John was sitting there starting to see the unlikeliness of Jesus being the one to mount an attack on the Roman government, to take over Jerusalem, and to reestablish the throne of David. But I believe John's doubts were even deeper than that, because there's a second definition of doubt, and that is to have no confidence in someone or something. You know, he seems so sure of who Jesus was and preparing the way for Jesus, but now that the ministry had begun, and he starts seeing that this is not going the way that we thought it would go. Are you really the chosen one, or are we looking for another? That's just one example of the kinds of doubts that God and Jesus have had to take on over the years. I don't think it's any secret that God and Jesus and the Bible have seen their fair share of doubts. People will question their existence. They question their, their capabilities, their power, their goodness, like we talked about yesterday in this hour, their, their creation, even their salvation. Jesus' teachings, his miracles, and even his resurrection, they've... And those who have these kinds of doubts are typically labeled in the negative. We typically, when people start doubting, we typically say, well, they're just weak. They're weak in their faith. In fact, isn't that what Jesus said to Peter, as we'll look at in just a minute? Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? We say that those who doubt, they, haven't, they just haven't been taught properly. They don't know. They don't understand. Or maybe they were taught, they just didn't pay good enough attention the people who doubt, they're worldly, they're sinful, they're selfish, and the list can go on and on of all these things that when we see someone doubting, we just automatically label them in the negative. And if you don't believe me, all you have to do is look to Thomas, an apostle of the Lord who, when Jesus came back and as he appeared to the apostles in that upper room and Thomas wasn't there, he I can only imagine what he was thinking. No, he was not there. Hey, you know, unless I can touch him, unless I can feel him, then I will not believe, he says. And because of that one moment, he's no longer Thomas. He's what? Doubting Thomas. See, we forget what happened several days later in that same upper room when Jesus appears to Thomas. And when Jesus says, look, here are the holes. Here's my side. Stick your hand. Touch, please. And believe. Thomas has this great, I would suggest, equal to Peter's confession of faith. He has this great statement, my Lord and my God. But see, we don't remember that part of doubting Thomas's story. We just remember he doubted. Would it surprise you to know that there are current disciples of Jesus with their questions and with their doubts? There may be people in your local congregation, maybe even your families, who are wrestling with certain questions and certain fears. They may be dealing with sickness or the loss of a family member because of a sickness, wondering why God would allow such pain and such suffering. Your congregation's young people 
And maybe even your own children are struggling with the ability to serve God and still be accepted by the world and their peers. Maybe even you yourself are sitting here with your own questions and your own doubts. And we assume that Christians should have all the answers. Almost like when you get buried in the waters of baptism, something happens under the water and shoots you full of all the answers, and now you've got it. And when we don't have the answers, we question effectiveness as a disciple of Christ and their status in the local congregations. And we have come to associate doubt with inadequacy and weakness. And what maybe we'll talk a little bit more about in the, the question and answer period is I believe what has happened in present day churches is in our local congregations and homes we've created a culture where people are afraid to share what they are struggling with. We are in the middle of a pandemic. And I'm not talking about one that can be helped with masks and booster shots. In my book, Finding My Faith, I illustrate the problems of what's happening among the Lord's people. A Lifeway research uh, study showed that 70% of young people, teenagers really, who grew up in Christian homes and churches will leave the faith when they leave home for the very first time. That number is absolutely staggering to me. That 70%, 7 out of 10 of our young people are going to leave and give up their faith, even though they grew up in congregations that are teaching fundamental principles, they're teaching the Bible, and they're teaching about Jesus. It goes one step further because it's not just a young person problem. Another study that was done by 21st century Christian, U.S. congregations of Churches of Christ have decreased 12% since the year 2000. To take it one step further, in another local, uh, or I'm sorry, in another recent research, this one done by, by Pew Research, it found that 80% of Americans believe in God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, hey, that sounds wonderful, 80%. Uh, that's down from the, the mid-90s, from just about 10 to 15 years ago. And of that 80%, only 56% believe in the God of the Bible. In other words, the rest are saying, I believe that there is something, maybe it's God, it's a higher power, but the God of the Bible, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God of the Bible, then I'm not so sure. And this, I, I found just this last week, my father-in-law posted it, who preaches out in California. In a new Gallup poll, it is found that only 20% of American adults believe the Bible is the inspired literal word of God. Those numbers are staggering to me. Christians all over the country are tired and confused. They are doubting and they are struggling with what to believe and how to live. And we have a choice, I believe. We can continue to make people feel guilty for having questions and needing answers, or we can start creating a culture that encourages people to ask questions, seek Bible answers, and leave feeling encouraged to keep growing. I told you at the beginning that the title to me was very personal, Overcoming My Doubts. I grew up in a congregation in Brea, California. And we rarely miss services as a family. In, in fact, growing up playing sports, the number one rule in our house was if it falls on a Wednesday night Bible study or a Sunday morning, Sunday night worship service, we were going to miss the game, we were going to miss the practice. And I excelled in Bible classes. Christine Kirchville, some of you know who that is. Barry was with us for a gospel meeting here this last week. And uh, it was, it's Barry's mother. Barry and I grew up in the same congregation. And his mother was one of my Bible class teachers. And she always told me and told my parents growing up, she said, that boy will be a preacher one day. I got all my gold stars on the chart for knowing my memory verse and for being there for, for every class, at least the ones that, that, that we had the opportunity to make. And I felt that growing up, I had a strong understanding of the Bible facts and the Bible stories. I knew about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I knew about Joseph. I knew about Jesus and Peter. I knew about Ruth and Rahab. 
I could quote to you the memory verses. And it wasn't until my, I call it the great awakening that I had in college, Florida College, a Christian school, mind you, that I began to see alternate worldviews for the very first time. I was starting to see how other people interpreted scripture. I was away from home for the first time, and so mom and dad didn't have control of me any longer. And I found that there is this interesting change of dynamic in my life to where I would start seeing what I knew was wrong, but I didn't know how to combat it biblically. And in fact, when I did combat things biblically and try to find Bible answers, even that was combated with different arguments that I wasn't prepared for. Things like homosexuality is a sin. And it says in Leviticus, and I would quote Leviticus, and then it would come back, well, Leviticus is the Old Testament. Do you eat pig? Do you eat shellfish? Well, yeah, I do. And for the very first time, I was being hit with the opposition. But wait a minute, didn't I know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Didn't I know my memory verses? Didn't I have good attendance at Bible class? And I started realizing that there was this transition from those young Bible classes where we teach the cute little fun stories with crafts, and then we get into the middle school, high school classes, and it's no sex, no drugs, no alcohol. And no one ever made a connection of, here's what Abraham has to do with your faith today. Here's what Joseph is trying to teach us today. Here's why living a righteous life, it's more than just no sex, no drugs, no alcohol. It's living a righteous life pleasing to God. Those connections were never made. And so I began questioning. Was I taught the right way? Was I taught the right things? You know what, by the way, now that I think about it, how is God eternal? Why do good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people? Is God even listening to prayers? Is is the Bible really God's accurate word? Can I follow God's word? And then I started thinking, does, does this mean because I'm questioning I'm weak in faith? Am I sinning for questioning? Should I ha- hide my doubts and, my ho- and, and hope that the preacher maybe just preaches a lesson soon so I can get the adequate answers? And then I read, and I don't know why it hit me like it did, but in Matthew chapter 14, I read the story of Peter walking on water. And it made me rethink how I approach Scripture and how I approach finding biblical answers. In Matthew chapter 14, you have John the Baptist beheaded at the beginning of the chapter, Jesus feeding the 5,000 in the middle of the chapter there that the apostles would have witnessed the feeding of the 5,000, this great miracle that Jesus performed. And that night, as they all get onto a boat, Jesus hangs back, and in the middle of the night, you remember, Jesus comes walking out to the boat in the middle of a windstorm. And it says that the apostles were afraid because they said, look, it's a ghost. And so they cried out in fear. And Jesus, in verse 27, says... Be of good cheer, it is I, do not be afraid. Now Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And so Jesus says, come. And when Peter had come out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now I want you to get this mental picture in your mind of you're in the middle of this storm, and they're already afraid, and if they're... Not not just the storm, but now they have Jesus or a ghost walking on water and they hear a familiar voice, but we still don't know if it's really him. And he says, it's I, do not be afraid. And Peter says, if it is you, let me come to you. Right there, what a bold statement of faith. But do you still see the doubt? If it is you, now I'm not 100% convinced. But if it is you, allow me to come out to you. And Jesus says, come. Now let's stop there for just a minute. What if it wasn't Jesus? 
What if it really was a ghost? But yet Peter has enough gumption to stick his feet over the side of the boat in a storm and see if it's really Jesus. What an amazing act that is. And then, listen, Peter had come out of the boat. He walked on water, the text tells us. He did something that none of us have ever done. I remember trying as a little kid to see how fast I could run and how many steps I can get, you know, if I move my feet fast enough on top of the pool. I never walked on water. Peter did. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter helps illustrate several points about doubt and how to overcome it. Through his strengths and even through his weaknesses, I learned how to work through my own struggles. I learned how to get questions answered, and more importantly, I learned where to get my questions answered. And I'm not saying that overcoming that your, your doubts will be easy, but I do want to assure you there is a better way than hiding what you're feeling. The following suggestions are meant to be just that, suggestions. Because the truth of the matter is, we looked at this a little bit yesterday in our open forum, we all have different upbringings. We have different backgrounds, different family dynamics. We all have different doubts. We have different reservations. We all seek and process information in different ways. And our doubts can span a vast majority of topics. But I can assure you this, you're not alone. We are all on a spiritual journey that is bound to have its ups and downs, and I hope that my suggestions will just help you start your journey or to help others that you're in contact with start your journey to find confidence to answer those doubts. And I believe even though we are all different, these suggestions can bring similar outcomes, a stronger faith in our Savior and in our God. I want to share with you just a few things that I did to overcome my doubts and what I learned from this story of Peter walking on water. The first thing I'm going to suggest to you is change your mindset. As stated earlier, we have, I believe, been trained as a society that doubt equals fear and doubt equals weakness. I mean, even Peter was told by Jesus, so you have little faith, why did you doubt? We'll come back to that in just a moment. To many, doubt equals a lack of faith. After all... How can we have a strong faith in God but still have so many questions? However, put yourself back in that boat for just a moment. In a boat full of doubters, Peter was the only one willing to cry out to Jesus and say, If it is you, let me come to you. In a boat full of apostles, the closest people to Jesus who had walked and talked with him daily, who just witnessed the feeding of the 5,000, they were all unwilling to speak up, but Peter said, I'll come to you, Lord. He was the only one willing to go out on a limb and cry out to Jesus, if it is you. Maybe he still wasn't sure, but he was the only one brave enough to question and seek an answer. So he got out of the boat and he walked on water. I would argue that the disciples who stayed on the boat with their mouths shut, they were the weak ones. They were satisfied with just living in fear. Peter was the only one with faith strong enough to do something about it. Yes, he struggled. Again, we'll get back to that in just a moment. But his faith led him somewhere no other disciple was willing to go. We mentioned yesterday, O ye of little faith, that Jesus mentioned to Peter after he began to sink. He did not say, O you unbeliever. No, Peter still needed work, as we all do. 
But questions of, of, of doubt don't have to equal weakness. When we can change our mindset, we see that if, proper, if we properly channel our questions and doubt, we can begin to take giant steps towards building a strong spiritual faith. I believe in order to grow, we have to humble ourselves and admit we need help. And if I have doubts, I have a choice. I can stay in the boat and I can live a life of fear, or I can do what Peter did and I can take a step forward and start looking for answers. Which leads me to the next thing. Don't be afraid to step out of the boat. We cannot be afraid to take that step and start seeking answers. If I wanted to overcome any of my doubts, I had to be brave enough to take that step and admit that I needed the help. I couldn't wait for the answers to come to me. I couldn't wait for the preacher to preach a lesson. I couldn't hope and pray that the Bible class would somehow answer whatever it is I was going through. I didn't want to reach rock bottom before seeking help. I had to be willing to step out of my comfort zone and seek guidance. In my book, Finding My Faith, I discuss the importance of asking questions. We've all been taught that certain things are common knowledge, haven't we? I was taught growing up there's no such thing as dumb questions. But we all know then there's that one kid who has to ask the question, and we all say, that was a dumb question, right? We have opportunities in our congregations where people can ask questions, but I have found that they are afraid to in fear of it being a dumb question. Because it's something that should be common knowledge to Christians. Questions like, I had someone ask me one time, I was afraid to ask what Christ was. Was it Jesus' last name? You hear Jesus Christ? What does that even mean? I was afraid growing up to ask the question of what's a denomination. I just knew when someone asked me when I was in middle school and high school, if you go to church, where do you go to church? Or I, I go to Bray Church of Christ. Oh, what denomination? It's not denominational. Don't ask me what that means. I just knew the answer to give. I know what it means now. Don't sit there and think, oh, we'll have to explain it to them later. We have to, I, I believe it's vitally important to ask questions. And as churches and individuals make people feel comfortable asking questions. We should encourage others to ask questions about God, their faith, their doubt, and yes, even maybe their congregations. How else are we expected to learn and grow? You look at examples from scriptures, look at what happens at the beginning of Luke chapter 11, where the disciples of Jesus... Well, Jesus was praying in a certain place after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John also taught his disciples. Well, wait a minute. Isn't that like Christian 101 to be able to pray and talk to God? What is prayer? It's talking to God. It's as simple as that. The disciples of Jesus didn't know how. They said, teach us to pray. We want to be better. We want to know more. What about Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian eunuch? As Philip approaches the eunuch, he sees him reading from the scroll there. He says, do you understand what you're reading? He says, well, how could I unless someone guides me? How many of us, if you're reading something in Scripture and someone comes, do you understand? Oh, yeah, I get it, I get it. Because we're afraid of admitting, maybe I don't. Maybe I don't have a proper understanding, but I would never admit that to the preacher. Wouldn't admit it to mom and dad or my spouse or whoever it is. He said, well, how can I unless someone guides me? He was willing to humbly say, I, I don't have a clue. Can you, tell, can you tell me? The rest of the text tells us at that point on, he began teaching Jesus. And then at some point in that conversation, look, there's water. What stops me from being baptized? He went from, how can I unless someone guides me, to having his questions answered and being a saved soul. Or what about a little bit farther along? Where Paul sees these, these men, he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, sir, we haven't even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Can you tell us? 
so he started teaching. I've seen a problem in modern day churches, and that is we assume that everyone should be on the same level spiritually. We believe everyone should already know the simple matters of faith, and when someone asks a question that we assume is elementary, we label them as weak. But may I be so bold to say that just because someone has doubts or needs questions answered, that doesn't mean weakness. I would suggest that they are one of the few strong enough to step out of the boat and walk towards Jesus. That if their heart is in the right place and they are searching scriptures and they are genuinely seeking answers and knowledge and truth. And I would go as far to say that those who ridicule those who are seeking answers, we're the weak ones who are just sitting in the boat. Jesus, when his disciples said, teach us to pray, he taught them to pray. When that eunuch said, how can I unless someone teaches me? Philip sat down and he taught. We haven't even heard if there is a Holy Spirit. And so Paul teaches them truth. It is up to us to cultivate an environment in our homes and in our congregations where individuals can feel comfortable seeking Bible answers to their doubts and to their questions. And if we don't, then shame on us for not giving those individuals a place to grow. Because if they don't get it from the congregation or from the homes, and especially from the Bible, they will find their answers somewhere else. And it's no wonder to me, then, why 70% of young people will leave the faith. Why more and more people are not believing in God. Why more and more people are giving up. Now, this is where Peter faltered a little bit. He was doing something incredible. He had taken that step. He had the courage. He had the faith to step out of the boat and start walking on water. But then when he saw that the winds and the waves were boisterous, he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. We've just mentioned that it's okay to ask questions and to, to seek answers. Oh, that's going a little, I don't know what just happened there. Let's back up. We just mentioned that it's okay to ask questions and seek answers, but the heart from which those questions come makes all the difference. We talked about this again yesterday in our open forum. That doubting for the sake of proving a point only seeks selfish ambitions, but doubting for the sake of searching for genuine answers seeks truth. And in Peter's moment of weakness, he knew where to search. He reached out and he cried, Lord, save me. In Hebrews chapter 12, we'll come back to Matthew 14 in just a moment. But in Hebrews chapter 12, we have this, this great statement right after the Hebrews 11 where you get all these great men and women of faith. And you get all these great, wonderful things that were done because of their faith. But after that, in verse twelve and, or chapter 12 and verse 1, it says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame as he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Life is heavy and sin is difficult. The loss of a loved one is burdensome, and we have all these, these weights that so easily ensnare us and these things that pull us down. There's so many distractions that can pull us away from Jesus, and instead of letting doubt and fear creep in, we need to keep our eyes focused on the only one who can pull us from that storm. And for all of Peter's doubts in those moments where he was walking on water, notice it's when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he put them on the storm that he began to sink. Well, and we would look at that and we would say, well, you should have kept your eyes on Jesus. Stay focused on Jesus. And there's great parallels to be made with that argument. But what I think is even more fascinating is that in the middle of the storms, as he's sinking, yes, he took his eyes off Jesus, he begins to sink. But while he's sinking, he had enough faith and enough sense to look back up and say, Lord, save me. Not everyone does that when they're questioning and doubting. 
I can only imagine what that scene would have been like. That there's Peter flailing in the water, and as he looks up, there's Jesus still standing. Seeing, I'm sinking. He's not. The only thing that can save me now is right there. Lord, save me. Paul tells New Testament believers that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The only way we are going to make it through our storms and our doubts and our questions is to have a steady diet of God's word focused on finding your answers in Jesus. I mentioned a few moments ago that 20% of Americans believe the Bible is the inspired word of God. Quite frankly, we have gotten too far away from our Bibles. We don't read it, we don't study it, we don't follow it, and we don't teach it enough. And it's no wonder why Christians are doubting and leaving the faith. No wonder why churches are disappearing. No wonder the world seems to be winning. We haven't taken the time to point people back towards Jesus. We tell people they're weak when they doubt and asking the wrong types of questions is wrong. So they go and seek answers elsewhere. And nowadays it's easier than ever because if you want an answer, all you have to do is pull out the phone of your pocket and your answers are right there. We should be encouraging the questions, encouraging people to share their doubts so we can point them back to Jesus and how to use the Bible and how to use it properly. Teach them that in the middle of their storms, they can say, Lord, save me, and there is a Savior who is there. What an amazing blessing that is. And then lastly, and we'll open it up for some questions here in just a, a few minutes. Surround yourself with those who have spiritual goals. I believe the final step, this is what hit me when I was going through some of my doubts. The final step in overcoming your doubts is one of the least talked about moments in the story of Peter walking on water. We get through the story, Peter walks on water, Peter sinks in the water, Peter's being pulled out of the water. You get that, oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Once they were all back in the boat and everything calmed down, and I just, in my mind, I picture this clear calm after the rough few moments they just witnessed. They went from in the middle of the, the sea being tossed back and forth to there's a ghost, it might not be a ghost, Peter's getting out of the boat, he's a crazy kook, He's walking on water. He's sinking in water. Maybe that is Jesus. And now we're back in the boat, all in just a matter of a few moments. And I just imagine this calm. And the other disciples in the boat were able just to say, truly you are the Son of God. My wife's mother passed away at a at a young age, Brooke was just a, a junior in, in college, senior at that point. And she wrote in a notebook a lot of questions that she wanted her, her mom to answer, but she knew that she wouldn't have the opportunity because she was dying of cancer. And one of the questions was, who do I talk to if I have questions when I'm raising children? Mom, you're not going to be there. And her mom wrote in that notebook, as she was sick laying in bed in her last several weeks, she would just take time to write in that notebook and, and give these answers to Brooke. And under that question, who do I talk to? Who, where do I get my questions answered? She wrote, find someone who's raising their children well and ask them. And there's been moments Brooke and I have had to do that. We have a two, four, six, and nine-year-old. We have a lot of questions. And we find people that we feel like are doing it well and godly, and we seek answers. We surround ourselves with people who are raising their kids well, because that's what I want my kids to act like and look like. If you want to be spiritually successful... Surround yourself with people who have the same goals you have. 
Don't get persuaded by the crowds or whatever the current popular opinion is or whatever the latest religious fad or the fancy speakers are saying. We teach our kids that evil company corrupts good morals. I would also suggest to you that the opposite is true, that good company promotes good morals. We need to make our families and our congregations places where people can come and they can find help growing spiritually closer to Jesus. We need to cultivate environments that help doubting individuals and families get their questions answered. We need to surround them with God's love, His mercy, and His grace. Because I don't know how many times we say this, we want to be in heaven and I want to take as many people as we can with us. Well, do we really believe that? That when someone is struggling with doubt, when we don't tell them, uh, we don't tell them how wrong they are and that they're failing spiritually. They need to be pulled into the boat with God's people. They need to be wrapped up and they need to be loved. And they need to be encouraged to keep seeking answers. We encourage them to keep walking with Jesus. They need answers. They need Jesus. There's a story. I don't know if it's, it's true or, or not. But there was a story of Ed Harrell at one point. Many of you know Ed Harrell and we miss him. I got to have a class with him at Florida College. He taught a special seminar class and only three of us took the class, uh, which was kind of unfortunate. But better for us, we got more time uh, with him. But someone tells a story of him that here he is in his old age and he's doing a gospel meeting somewhere, staying with a family who... Uh, was housing him for the week, and he disappeared. They couldn't find him. And after searching outside, and maybe he went on a walk, after searching the, the house, they found him upstairs in, in whoever's house it was, their little study. And he's got books all over the floor. He said, what are you doing? We've been looking for you. He said, you know, I had a question that I'd never gotten the answer to, and so I thought I'd just come up here and I'd study just a little bit. He had books laid all over the place, and in his hand was a Bible. And I remember hearing that story for the first time, and I'm a, I'm a young college kid thinking, he's got white hair, he should have it all figured out, right? But no, here he was, still seeking answers. Sometimes still not sure and still trying to find the answer where the answer deserves to be found in God's word. John the Baptist struggled with recognizing who Jesus truly was at that moment. He sat in prison and he sent his own followers to make sure Jesus really was the chosen one. Peter walked on water but still sank. Abraham had a son with someone else who wasn't his wife. The list can go on and on of people in Scripture who had their moments. And maybe you're having yours. That's okay. Instead of hiding them, I think it's time to overcome them. It's time to change your mindset and try to do some hard things. It's time to take a step out of the boat and ask your questions. Dive into God's Word. Surround yourself with those people who want you to succeed. If left unchecked, doubts can hold us back, but when handled in a spiritual, healthy, and mature way, doubts can make us grow into a spiritual force that would rival the likes of those spiritual giants that we admire so much. And who knows, maybe one day you will be the spiritual giant helping someone overcome their doubts. I encourage you to keep going. Keep studying. Keep praying. Stay focused on Jesus. We're going to open it up to some questions. Do we just go right into it? or Yes. I'll walk around and offer people the opportunity to ask questions. I wanted to start off by first of all saying thank you, Kevin, for the presentation and the biblical basis on which you made it from those two wonderful texts of John's doubts and Peter's example in this latter one. 
And my question involves the symbolic application of the winds and the waves. That was the, uh, the thing that those towering and, and, and blustering waves and towering, uh, towering waves and blustering wind was what caused him to take his eyes off of Jesus. In your opinion, and maybe in the opinion of others, what are some things today symbolically that do the same for us? What are the towering waves? What, what are the blustering winds that threaten us? Yeah. and those waves and those towering waves are, are coming. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've seen on a spiritual high. There, there are giants. There are, are pillars of faith. And I've seen toppled over, those giants toppled over because of what life throws at I mean, we can, uh, And I'm sure you have some that you, you're thinking of now, but I've seen sickness of a loved one, loss of a loved one. Opinion that maybe we're not supposed to handle on our own. That maybe God is trying to push us in a way to say, come back. Rely on me. Remember me. I'm here. That's that stay focused on Jesus. And so the winds and those waves, I mean, they can be any number of or any number of us. But but those are some of the big ones that constantly. Any comments on that question or any observations anyone would like to add on that point? Kyle, do you have anything to add? James 1 and verse 5. First, and It's full of doubts, right? Uh, we all have our moments. But yet you... And you will find knocking, the door shall be open. Thing we want, or, or you know, uh, within reason, what it look like, but that when I go to him, especially for things in the context of going through these trials, I need to do. Do I have the confidence that God is? Uh, and I believe more. That's without doubt. That's to me the context that. To reconcile some of these things that Jesus says, how many of you being good fathers when his son asked for bread would give him a stone? He says it in that same context of ask, seek, knock. Well, how many of you, if I can use some of the same in your times of trials, give me wisdom. and uh, will show me the way through his word. We talked about this a little bit yesterday as well. Uh, we have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness, as Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3 tells us. Uh, and God's word is there, and God's word will show us the way. Does that help answer that?
I guess it was, uh, when you were at Parkview uh, down in the Houston area, you did a lesson similar to what he presented this morning as far as talking about the statistics that show our young people are often falling away. And what were some of the points you drew from that data and, and the solutions that you saw as, as viable? Well, it was just based out of Deuteronomy in how the people would say, when, when your children ask, what do these stones mean? That God anticipated that our children are going to ask questions. Right. And so I just went through in the, in the Pentateuch over and over again, God expects that our children are going to ask questions. And so we need to make sure that we're ready to give the answer. And then in all those cases where it says, when your children ask, then, then Moses gives the answer that they're supposed to give. And it was, you know, like uh, God gave uh, how God acted in history or what God's word is or God's power, that those are all the things that would point back to that. So uh, we need to encourage our children to ask well, absolutely. those questions. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so I, I, uh, I had experience, you know, my, uh, my older brother, he would, he's not here. I can say whatever I want to about him. Uh, but uh, he, he has been very open with people too, that he went through his moments where he was ready to give up. And uh, it's because a lot of the times he was asking questions. He is one of those that if something doesn't make sense, I'm going to make it make sense. And I need to ask questions about it. At the end of the day, his answers were always by preachers and the different people. Um, that's just what we do. That's just what we do. And the more he would ask, they would say, well, that's just what we do. So it's, it's what we've always done. Um, I would suggest to you, don't do that. Uh, it's like, like you were just saying, we're in, you should be encouraging children and, and anybody, friends, family, to ask questions. And when it gets down to that base, well, that's continually coming back to God and God, like you were just saying, this is what God has done. Look at what God has done. Look at what God's provided. Can, that's keeping the eyes on Jesus. Giving biblical answers. Understanding the Bible. Understanding why God has a plan and what it means for you as, as a 10, 20, 30, 40-year-old person in today's life. That God still has a plan. And the more you can draw it back to that, God's plan, God, God in their mind, Questions come later, oh yeah, God's got a plan. God knows. God, and it helps just solidify who God is in their minds. Chris Reeves. Can you comment on, comment on Mark 16, 14? Specifically the upbraided part, and he upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them that had seen him after he was risen. My understanding is that Jesus is not going to upbraid them if they're not responsible. Secondary evidence, there's, there's eyewitness accounts and then there's secondary evidence. For that, so is the, is there not also a dynamic here about doubt and disbelief that Jesus is expecting us to accept the evidence? There's a lot of dynamics about doubt and unbelief, and we've discussed a number of them. But is not one of the dynamics we have to have some skin in the game? We have to accept the evidence, and would not Jesus upbraid us possibly today for not? accepting the evidence. So I wanted you to comment about the upbraided part. Yeah. Uh, at, at the end of the day, got to meet the road at some point, right? Uh, I mean, we talked about this a little bit yesterday as well. Why are questions being asked? Uh, at the end of the day, it gets to the heart. And you go back to the story of Thomas for just a moment. What does Jesus say right after he, he has this great realization? My Lord and my God. Well, you believe because why? You saw. You've got the evidence standing right in front of you. Uh, but what about those who can't see but still have to believe? Yeah, at some point, we have to get to a point in our faith where the rubber the road, and, and am I willing to accept these answers I'm, I'm getting, that, that the evidence is right before us. And I, I believe we can look and see evidence is all around us. Uh, that God's word, you really believe God's word is, is his word, 
uh, the inspired word of God? Here's the answers. Are you willing to accept what is right uh, before you? And, and at some point, doubt, and it, again, it depends on the heart. We talked about this a lot yesterday, the individual situation, their background, where they're coming from, uh, all those things. Uh, yeah, there are moments where you just have to say, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is doing any good. <laughs> you are not seeking genuine answers. You're trying to win an argument. You're trying to prove a point. And in today's standard, that's more how I see that working out today. Cause we don't have Jesus right in front of us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Brother Graham has a comment. Faith is a matter in which a person needs to grow. Peter said, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge patience, and so on. So it's a growth. That means that when a person obeys the gospel, he does so out of faith. But it's not the strong faith that he later develops. He has to grow. The Lord gives attention, of course, to a person's opportunities and a person's abilities. And based on each one's personal, personal abilities and opportunities, he judges us as to whether we're growing in faith, whether we're diligent. There in Second Peter chapter 1, diligence, of course, was a requirement, giving all diligence Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and so on. He doesn't specify an one pound of faith or two inches of virtue or three kilograms of something else. But he's going to judge us based upon whether or not we've diligently applied ourselves in these growth areas. That's something I believe we need to take into account. Now, that person with doubts who honestly is seeking answers, trying to study the scriptures, seeking out those who can help him, he's growing. If he's not seeking answers, he's not growing. And so we need to commend people like that. We need to encourage them. We don't need to give them the back of the hand or show them the door. We need to encourage them to do what's right. Now, Mark asked me to make some comments about uh, teaching young people who have doubts. I've been here since 1967 at the school. Of course, I've been gone a little bit. I went away and worked on my degree in school administration, so forth. I spent a few years in Huntsville, but even while over there, I did some Bible curriculum materials for the school. And uh, I've been here a long time. I've taught a lot of people. I don't know that I have any uh, silver bullets or any magical answers. But it's always occurred to me that young people respond best when they're clearly shown what the Bible teaches. And when they see that being acted out, being lived day to day by people, by people who sincerely love God and are seeking to grow themselves, and by doing that, we develop relationships, not only with the young, but also with others. And it's in those relationships that we're able to teach one another, to encourage one another, to warn one another. And those young people, because of their trust, their confidence in a teacher or a parent or a neighbor, are more willing to ask questions because that relationship has been built. The foundation is there. And that's the kind of relationship out of which young people, as well as others, grow in faith. Yeah, I, I, to comment on that for just a moment, um, 
So part of what I did when I, uh, when I read the statistic that you saw on the screen earlier, 70% uh, of teenagers are leaving the faith when they leave home for the first time. Um, that was staggering to me. And that's, that's what really jump-started my thinking of the book, Finding My Faith. Uh, because I realized where that was about the time where I started questioning. And, um, and so I, we taught a Bible class at Marion Street here in Athens, and that became two more Bible classes of strengthening my faith and finishing my faith, and then it became uh, a book. And what I did in my research was I've been, I've been blessed to work with congregations. I grew up in California. Uh, I, I was preaching in San Jose before I, I moved here to Athens, working here in Athens. Um, in Florida, uh, Indiana, Kentucky, where I've done internships, I sent a survey to all these preachers that I knew all over the country, and I said, I want you to give these to your young people. I don't want you to read the questions, because I didn't want those guys to start persuading these kids how to answer. I said, I just want you to hold out these papers, say, can you fill these out for me real fast, put them back in the envelope, mail it back to me. I'd, I'd pay for the postage and everything. And I was asking the young people questions all over the country, how do you feel like you're welcomed and accepted at the church that you attend? How do you feel about, can you, can you ask questions? Do you feel heard? But, and all these kinds of questions. And it was amazing. It doesn't matter what state they were from, what upbringing they had. What it, they all felt the same way. And they all felt like this. I don't have many people I can seek answers from in this congregation. The Bible classes are teaching us things we already know like no sex, drugs, and alcohol. We need to know how to live better in a sinful world. They were saying, we don't feel accepted here. We're, we're a different group from the rest of the congregation. We're not seen. We're not heard. We're not used. We're people too. We want to get up and try leading songs. We want to get up and say prayers. We want to, do, we want to be active. And we're not given those opportunities. My own personal experience, my older brother and I, we were the two football players in the congregation. We, you know, we, I know it looks like I, I've gained a little bit of weight, then I'll just keep it at a little bit. Uh, but when I was in high school, man, I, I, could, I was lifting two or three times a day. And our joke at, at our home congregation was we're only good to people when they need chairs moved. And that's about all we were good for. And it just got me thinking that we're cultivating this relationship with our young people, especially with what Mr. Graham was just talking about. We're cultivating this relationship with our young people that you're not important until you're married and start having kids because that's when we can start filling the seats and pews and, and Bible classes. And man, I just, I felt, one, I felt what they were feeling, but two, I feel like we, we can do better by cultivating an environment where they feel welcomed and wanted. So I, I would encourage you, like you said, have relationships with those young people. That middle school, high school age, they need people in their lives because I'm not too far off from that. I'm 34, so I can still remember that with a little bit of clarity. Mom and dad were probably the last places I wanted to go to admit that I'm thinking about some things and I, I, I need some answers. But who I went to were those spiritual giants that I saw sitting in the pews or the preacher that had formed a relationship with me and were sitting on his couch one Sunday night. We'd all gotten fast food, playing video games. And I said, hey, can I ask you a question? It wasn't in a Bible class. It wasn't in a special study. It was just we were just sitting together. But it's because he took time to form a relationship. I mean, that is fundamental, making them feel like they are part of the group of saints wherever you're meeting, making them feel like they're wanted, they're desired, uh, and, and they have a purpose besides just moving chairs for potlucks. But I can talk more about that, or there's a book called Finding My Faith you can go grab out there. Thanks, Kevin, for uh, well done this morning and yesterday, too, in the question session. And I'll put a bookstore plug in for your book also. If you don't have it, um, avail yourself of that opportunity. But I love the fact that you focus on Peter, who I, it seems to me is a in some ways a neglected character uh, in our study and preaching, certainly compared to the to Paul's epistles. But, um, and by the way, another bookstore plug, there's a really good lecture in the 2010 lectureship book on Peter. I mean, it's a really good, maybe one of the best ever. You can probably figure out who wrote it. But we, uh, we, we sometimes need to 
devote more time. And the point there is that the, what, everything you said about Peter is true, but the story doesn't end there. I mean, this doubter who overcomes his doubts is the person whose speech is recorded on the day of Pentecost. And right. he reminds the Jerusalem church in Acts 15 that this was not an accident that the Lord by my mouth, he said, chose that this should happen, and, and that the Gentiles should hear. I mean, he's also the one who goes to Cornelius. So I think it's really important to help young people, or as you say, this is not an age-specific issue, to understand that even though there are doubts, and they may be um, as significant. I mean, Peter's the guy who, you know, his wake-up call every morning for the rest of his life, the cock crowing, is a reminder that I denied my Lord. Mm -hmm. And yet he's, he's an elder who writes in 1 Peter 5 to his fellow elder. So here, the, I think the message is, yeah, doubts can be overcome and you can be triumphant over doubt. And but even piggybacking off of Kyle's question, I mean, James was a doubter. I mean, they, assuming that the author of the epistle to James is the brother of the Lord, which I, I think is the case. Um, Richard Baucom makes a British New Testament scholar makes a really good case that the structure of James is actually kind of channeling the Sermon on the Mount. Ask and you shall receive, seek and so forth. He, let him who asks and, you know, so you can, you don't have to agree with that, but you have there another example of someone who becomes active and prominent and useful in the Lord's service who came out of a, in some ways, a doubting background. Right. Uh, and, uh, I, I don't want to dominate it, but I, I can't let the opportunity pass to throw in a restoration history story. I, I loved your, the question on the point of there's no insignificant questions, no dumb questions when the person asked, was Christ the last name of, of Jesus? Um, there's a story in Mark Twain's autobiography, so if it's not true, at least it's true he said it. Um, so Christ, of course, is not his last name, but do you know what his middle initial was? And Twain, what Twain records is when he was a young printer's devil at Hannibal, Missouri, um, which uh, Alexander Campbell comes to preach there. And of course, Barton Stone lived his last years there, was buried at Hannibal. Campbell turns in an article for the newspaper that Twain's setting type for, and to save some time and space to get it in, uh, Twain doesn't use the name Jesus Christ, he just puts it J.C. And Campbell comes storming into the office when he got the proof and said, how dare you de desecrate my Lord's name? And so he left it in instructions for Twain to reset it, and Twain did, and every time he reset it, he said it as Jesus H. Christ. So for whatever that's worth, and it may be apropos of nothing, but um, th there are no dumb questions, right. and we need to treat um, someone's doubts with respect. Yeah. So two things on that very quickly. You know, you obviously we've chronicled some of Peter's doubts and we can be here all day chronicling his moments. <laughs> you know, Paul is another one. Killing Christians. He doubted the Lord. Absolutely. Uh, it became one of the greatest Christ. Um, you mentioned, you know, there is no age limit on, on some of these things. You're absolutely right. So uh, I just, I concluded a couple months ago now, actually, uh, a meeting in Tustin, California. And a lady came up to me one night, and I hadn't been able to meet her yet. But uh, she came up to me, and she says, you know, I, I have to go back to Idaho today. And I said, Idaho, what are you doing in, from Idaho? You know, I thought you were a member here. I just hadn't been able to get to her. She said, I drove down specifically for this. She said, the concepts, now I, I want to be clear, it was not my book, although that would be a great plug for truth to use, this book saves lives. No, uh, she said, the concepts in your book saved my life. She said, I, I had gotten so far away from God's blueprint and his standard of what his word actually is, that when I was handed a copy of your book, and I, first half of the book is understanding scripture. You cannot understand faith if you don't understand Scripture. So you get into Scripture and understand all the questions that come along with that, and then you start using life. She said that I didn't. Just made her, it pushed her back into God's world.
And she drove down to, from Idaho just to listen on this concept of finding my faith. And I'm in my 74 years because I'm finding it for the first time. Finding it from God's word and making my own decisions. Uh, and, and we need to, listen, we got to, all, all over, ages all over, make an effort, not just the, I teach the middle school, high school class at least once a year uh, at our congregation. And I give them moments at the end of every class, ask whatever question you want. I said, it stays in this room. Uh, unless we've got some major issues, we'll go t- talk to somebody. But it stays in this room, and we're going to give you Bible answers. I said, I want you to ask whatever. This is your safe place to answer these questions. But before class, I visit every single classroom we have downstairs at our church building. Uh, and I sit and I talk with the little kids. I sit at their table. I poke fun at them. And, and we're just we're goofing off because I want them at some point when they hit that middle school age to not say, well, who's this guy? He's never talked to me. No, they've got a relationship of years of me you know, playing Bible basketball with them or talking to them about how school is. or I mean, anything. Talk to those kids. Because I have a nine-year-old who he knows who is taking an interest in him at, at church. And he says, I like them, Dad. I said, yeah, I like them too. They're, you know, they're, they're good people. But they're listening, they're watching, and they're, you're forming those relationships. And it goes from early on to 74, finding your faith for the first time. Jeremy has a question or comment. Kevin, first of all, thank you. Uh, for your work. I have a, a question and then a, a couple of comments to follow up, if I may. Yeah. Your first statistic that you used about 70% of teenagers who grew up in a Christian home coming from Lifeway Research, I'm curious about that statistic. Is that in Christendom, Christianity, broadly where that's coming from? Yes, it okay. is. It is. And do you know of any and I'm, this is not in any way to minimize the significance of that statistic. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering, do you know of any sources that have spoken to that more among us, among New Testament Christians, and uh, that would a percentage that would speak to that? Not to my knowledge. Okay. Um, and, and some of that is difficult because yes. as autonomous congregations, we don't have a governing board that is looking at these statistics on a regular basis. Right. Does that make sense? No, absolutely. But I, I just will... didn't know if anybody had done any, any research. And maybe knows of something yeah, maybe somebody lines. knows of something. But I will say from personal experience, um, it's not too far off from what I've seen in, in what I would consider conservative Bible teaching congregations. Right. I know, and I, I don't remember the source, and so I would just have to say you'd have to look this up. I do know that... Um, some research has been done among uh, institutional congregations and specifically tying it to the participation of their homes in attendance and whether it's one parent, two parents, etc. And I, I don't remember the number, so I'm not even going to speculate, but I would just point to that and, and said that was I also found to be enlightening. But I appreciate what you've done. You, you answered kind of a second part in terms of some of the practical things we can do to cultivate those relationships, and I appreciate that. There's just a couple of verses that came to my mind. Um, and uh, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14, um, admonish the unruly, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be mm-hmm. patient with everyone. Right. And it seems to me that we're good at some parts of that and maybe not so at others. And, um, and then Jude verse 22, have mercy on some who are doubting. And that idea of, of showing mercy and extending patience. Mm-hmm. And I am immensely thankful for those who have been patient with me and uh, who have helped answer my doubts over the years, as I know you are. And I just think those are, are maybe a couple of key texts that might help us along those lines. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in regards to, while um, Kyle's got a question down here while he's walking down with the mic, um, the mother and father in the home, uh, just because kids reach an age where they might not want to talk to mom and dad does not give mom and dads to slack on their responsibilities. Uh, in fact, there are studies done, and, and I don't have it in front of me, so I can't quote who, who it was by, but uh, one of our elders has quoted it um, several times. Statistics will show that children uh, will follow the faith of their mothers, but do it with the intensity of their fathers. 
So think about that for a minute. They will follow the faith of their mother statistically, but with the intensity of their fathers. So dads, we may be going, but are we excited to go? Are we showing our kids why we're here, excited to be here? We're learning, we're studying, we're singing, we're praising, we're, we're, all those things. They're going to watch dads for the intensity side of things, which is just an interesting point. And it, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it starts, starts right there in the home. Kyle. Yeah, I found it interesting in the text that Chris brought up a minute ago in Mark 16 that there he actually, unlike the example you mentioned with Peter, uh, he doesn't describe that as unbelief. He describes it as small belief. But there in Mark 16, he rebukes them for their unbelief in not believing. And I wonder if that doesn't indicate to us that there is an issue sometimes of failing to resolve doubts. Um, do you have any comments on the importance or the danger of failing to resolve doubts? Yes. So a quick comment, too, in, in thinking about these um, you know, this instance in, in Mark 16, doubt before the cross was one thing. Doubt after the cross was also completely different because now I've told you, I've taught you, I was, we were with you, I was with you for how many, you watched me die, you watched me buried, and now here I am, and you're still? Like, what more do you need, almost? You know, so uh, the doubts, if they were still there, I'm sure that's why the, the chastising kicked up a notch at that point. Uh, but unresolved doubt, um, I mean, we can talk about practical, you know, and, and real life stories of what happens with unresolved it, it's a green wound, where it just, it, it sits there in your mind, and maybe you, you oh, okay, I'm, I got a satisfactory, but maybe didn't quite answer it completely, and we'll just shove it back there for later, well, the longer it sits back there and just sits and sits it could get worse and worse. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've seen marriages hit rocky times and even end in some points because one side, wife, had doubts early on, and we resolved those before we were married. But were they? Because they came up later, and it's now, well, now we're questioning everything, right? Uh, and so the, the danger of unresolved doubt, it sits there, and you, I almost feel like you can't be your true self because you're sitting there having to hide. Yeah, sure, I know what that. Like my example of denomination. I didn't want to admit I didn't know what that was. So I sit there, yeah, I'm non-denominational. And they're like, oh, great. I'm like, yeah, it is great. Maybe, I don't know. And then it just goes longer and longer. You know it. You're kind of, you might be, depending on what your doubts are, you're just kind of spiraled into a ball of lies or, you know, half-truth, and it's just... And then you finally learn, oh, man, I had some teaching opportunities. I didn't even know it. And so I would suggest whatever doubts you have, resolve them, get adequate answers, and don't be satisfied until you, they're answered biblically. Uh, and, and that way, nothing, no problems come up, come up later. Yeah. I, I want to uh, make a comment about the statistics you were making, but... Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to say I agree with you. We want to make it possible for people to feel comfortable to ask their questions. And anything that we've done to shut that down is not uh, good for the situation. Ken Ham, who did the Creation Museum and the, the ark that is on the south side of Cincinnati, um, he did two books. I can't remember the one of the name of both of them, but one of them was already gone. And what he was recording in that book is we used to think about our young people losing their faith when they went off to college and were on their own, such as you described this morning. But he also said, when we come back to the children in fourth through sixth grade, they've already lost their faith in the Bible by that time because of this worldview that is being presented in every form of media that there is. We've got to face the situation of our children losing faith by this different worldview that they are absorbing from the culture around us from the day they're old enough to 
take any kind of media into their hearts, see it and believe it and think about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have, um, I have a, a fourth grader. He's going into fourth grade. Um, the questions that he can come home with, the things that he's seen, you know, they get iPad time. That's how they do a lot of their learning when they finish certain things. They get free time on kids' YouTube. Of course, there's blocks and things that they can't get to. But man, it's still there, even on kids' YouTube. And the questions that, that, that we field at home because of that. Now, what I was taught early on, to, to your point, never, ever, and this can go for your own children in your own home or just your congregations, whatever, never say, we'll, we'll answer that later. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Because what that tells them in the back of their mind is a couple things. They, and that may not be true, but it tells them a couple things. You either don't know the answer or you don't want to take the time to answer it for me. So guess what? The next time he asks that question, it might be a friend at school. It might be a teacher. It might be Now, he's third going into fourth grade, so the questions now are, are minimal. But imagine as he grows. You know, I'd never say, I'm, we're not going to answer that right now. I say, you know what? That's a great question. I make him feel, that's a good question. I want to answer that. Can I have some time to think about how I'm going to answer that the right way? You know, you're not dodging the question, you're, but I'm going to put some thought into that. Can we talk about this later tonight? When I have a little bit more time, we can talk about it. Uh, and when you're in a Bible study, don't be afraid to tell people, you know what? I don't know. But don't ever leave it at, I don't know. I'm going to find out the answer. We're going to get back together. My brother works at Best Buy still from high school to now. He, he runs a couple stores up in the Brentwood area, uh, up, in, up in Tennessee. I'll, you know, ask and I'll try to give an answer. And my brother said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. He called me. I told him some things. He looked up some things in Scripture. He had, got an answer. A week later, he saw the guy again. He said, hey, by the way, he goes, I got an answer for you. And the guy looked at him like, you actually found, like, I thought you would just were blowing me off. He says, no, you asked. I want to give you an answer. And uh, nothing ever came of that study. They, they wanted to get together and study more, and he did a little bit, but nothing ever came of it. But at the same time, the guy was blown away that he would even take the time to answer. And our kids need to, to see that, that we will take time with them to make sure they are getting their faith cemented early on. Absolutely. I don't know where we are. I see lots of hands, so I'm going to go to Kyle. Okay. Well, just <laughs> piggybacking off of Jeremy's question about survey data, now, this is older from the 1990s, but it would be interesting to compare. In other words, this is survey data about Church of Christ young people who are the parents of the kids who are now saying, we don't have anybody to talk to and nobody to listen to. But David Lewis, who I was at FC with, now deceased, um, did this survey data. He was teaching at Abilene at the time. And it's uh, published in a book called Shattering the Silence. And then there's another one called The Faith of Generation X. And the main takeaway from it was that what they learned is that there's only marginally statistically, marginal statistical difference between what Church of Christ youth were reporting and what general national surveys report. That while we might like to think that our young people are different, not, not the case, at least according to what that was done. Absolutely. And then, I, I didn't finish my Mark Twain story, which was to your point. I've often wondered what if instead of storming into this office with an understandable attitude of anger that Campbell had, assuming the story's true, which I can understand. I mean, I might have lit my fuse too for somebody to be that disrespectful. But what if, what if he had taken a different tack and tried to explore with a young Samuel Clemens, why did you do that? What the different outcome of Twain, of Clemens's life, uh, might have been rather than skeptical. So yeah. you know, that's speculation, of course. Yeah, as he as he takes the microphone to the next person, you know, is uh, the more you can relate to somebody, you know, that's what Paul did when he taught. I'm I'm there with you. I'm the chief of sinners. I, you know, uh, the more you can relate with somebody and and get on their level and see where they're coming from and saying, can I understand why you are asking this or doing this? I mean, that can go a, a long way. Let me just add, there is a book by an institutional preacher named Flavel Yakely, I believe, called Why They Left. 
that offers a little bit of information like that too. Which one for? I'll remember that name, Flavel. Uh, there was, I appreciate the, the input about statistics. The other thing, um, you mentioned something about, uh, something was said a while ago about unresolved doubts, and it mm -hmm. made me think of uh, some, something you said about, you know, that's just the way we do it, or that's just what we do. And the problem with that is not just leaving the unresolved doubt, but that's, essentially, that's making ourselves the authority, the standard. Absolutely. It's just what we do. So then what's the difference in, so, you know, what's the difference in that and somebody else who says, well, this is what I think, or that's what I do, or that's what we do. It, it, and so it, it is just, not only is it not uh, resolving the doubt, not only is it not truly providing an answer, but I would suggest that's even sowing additional doubt, additional skepticism, and sowing seeds for even greater departure because the human then becomes the authority. Well, think, think about a kid going to mom and dad asking certain questions and the answer that they get is that's just what we do. Well, where's that coming from? You know, and that's, to me, that's important. Well, now, in that kid's mind, the answer of why we do what we do is because mom and dad said so. So then they go and leave home for the very first time and they're presented with all these new ideas. Well, mom and dad said this and it's, no, it's not rooted and grounded in, but God said so. There's a very big difference between God saying so and mom and dad saying so. Those should go together, obviously. But for a mom and dad to, to not just say, well, that's just what we do, but to show the why, here's what God has asked us to do and instructed us to do and, and all those things, that's why it's, I mean, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, not the word of mom and dad, right? So going back there and letting that be your source of this is why, it's ten times more adequate answer than just because. Absolutely. I want to suggest that every Bible class teacher follow the practice of having a Bible question and answer session. I've done that for years in my classes here at the school. I announce that every grading period we'll have a Bible question day. It doesn't have to be related to what we're studying. It can be anything in the Bible. I announce it in advance because I want them to have time to think of their questions and write them so they won't forget them that day. I also do it when I've taught young preachers classes. There's some young preachers in here today who've been in my classes. I always start those classes with what's on your mind. What questions do you have? And then at Rusty Youth Camp, where I've taught Bible for many years, I do the same thing. I teach class in the morning, but then in the afternoon I go and do a Bible question and answer session for high school classes. That's immeasurably important, not just because of the information it conveys, but also it helps to cement that relationship that right. I talked about earlier. It right. shows an interest, a real love for people, a desire to help them. And don't be afraid in those, if, if you end up doing some of those question and answer periods, don't be afraid of a couple things. Don't be afraid of the I don't know. Find someone who does and suggest that. We have Steve Mosley at our congregation. Some of you know him. He, he teaches here at ABS and chemistry, biology. And there's sometimes I get questions and I, I don't know. Steve does. Let's go talk to him. Let's go talk to this person because they'll be able to give an answer that's better than me. And again, it just shows that effort. But two, don't be afraid of hard topics either. We shy away from certain topics because they're uncomfortable and not fun to talk about. But we can't shy away from them. And maybe, just maybe, we'll learn something in studying those at the same time as well. But you know, there's a difference between saying that's just the way we do it and saying this is a traditional way of doing what this scripture teaches. So thank you so much Absolutely. for your lecture. Thank you all. And let me commend to everyone. We had hoped to have it ready in time for lectures, but Evan had also put together some uh, sermon notes for kids that will uh, be able to be something that can be used by children or even older, older kids uh, or older folks uh, during sermons to encourage them to follow along, encourage them uh, to take notes, and one of these ways to try to help them uh, really make these things their own rather yeah. than just what they've been told. Thank and and you for so the much. kids' ones, things for parents to do with kids through the week to just bring it all together. Absolutely.